It's the internet, you're busy. Let's do this for April 5th, 2024. For the next hour or so, let me help you sort through the world of gaming on Game Mess Mornings Live with me, Jeff Grubb. Today, it's a dregs day with a nasty boy, so let's talk about frame rates again. But first, please join me in welcoming today's co-host to Game Mess Mornings. It's nasty boy himself, Jesse Fatelli. Young Elmo, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. No, Happy thanks to be for here. Happy here. Friday. This is great. Absolutely, yeah. Um... I, uh, it worked out really good because uh, I'm, I'm a responsible person, Jesse. So, of course, I forgot oh, to tell sorry. Tam, who is the normal guest on Fridays, that he, like, hey, he could have Friday off. And then about a half hour ago, he's like, text me, he's like, hey, you, could you get someone else? I'm not feeling like great. I'm like, oh, yeah, I could do that. No problem. <laughs> Because <laughs> I, I, I'd already scheduled Jesse to be on the show, everybody. I'm like, oh, I got it. okay. Remember, tell Tam he could just have Friday off, and never, never did that. So I'm, hey, I think he's sleeping. Oh, I hope he went back to bed because it's, it's very early for him. So no one tell him that that, that happened. I just let him know that he could just have a restful day. Uh, but yeah, oh, no, Jesse, I, you, we were just talking about it before the show. Both feeling like we're finally recovered from packs. I, I definitely, yeah. I'm like, uh, it, it, the kind of thing where, I'm, hey, that's the Eastern time zone. I'm Eastern time zone. Why did it mess me up so bad? It's like, ah, you know, you get there and you want to stay up late with everybody. Uh, and then you want to get up early and get right back at it. And traveling in general just gives me the funk. Uh, so, yeah, kind of getting back home, finally getting back in the swing of things. I'm feeling pretty good now. And PAX, that was such a good time. It was so much fun. It, but you run your body into the ground for like five days straight. Yes. And then your body's like, I need, and especially, you know, as as every year goes by, it's like, I need an extra day to recover, and then eventually it's like a week and a half, and I'm like, well, I think I'm finally back in the groove of things. I think I finally, finally fixed my clock. Uh, Jesse, what have you been playing recently? You got any any fun games that have uh, been taking up your time through the first half of the year? Uh, I started playing Pepper Grinder recently, but the oh, one man. I really want to talk about is I played Content Warning for the first time yesterday. Yeah, we're playing it today. How was that? That game is so much fun. Mm. It, it has the hook that Lethal Company was missing for me. Because like I didn't really care about, oh, with Lethal Company, it's like, oh, you just kind of get the pieces and then whatever, and then you just move on. With this, it's like, no, you want that footage. Because that yeah. footage is so funny. And you don't get the footage unless you get the camera back. And so last time we were playing, we were just like, we just have to get the footage back. We don't, we, we, we just got to keep going. Man, and the okay. game just throws increasingly like strange creatures and things at you. And it, it's... It's so much fun, and then you uh, get the footage back. You all get to watch it. And it's really fun. Is it in, like the the loop? Is it very much like Lethal Company? Is there more to it than that? It is like it is almost to a T Lethal Company, where it's like right. you have three days to get a certain amount of likes as opposed to money. Sure, uh, you go down into a world that has like dangers. You're going through creepy corridors. There is monsters that are popping up, and then all the monsters have different like quirks to them right so it's like oh this one doesn't like when you shine light at it or, okay. or whatever and then it is okay you're not you're not down there to pick up items and bring them back you are down there to get footage of your friends doing like silly things with the monsters and you are making a youtube video and then you need to get the camera back to the ship and then you get to watch all what of the footage idea. that one person is, is and you can buy like new items so you can buy like reporter mics so we were like interviewing the monsters and like <laughs> you can buy party poppers and better flashlights and all this stuff. it's very very funny uh like i said we, we're gonna play this today this is our upf today everybody uh and uh, i did go through the rigmarole being like pointing out to my, my co-workers and colleagues hey it's free go ahead and pick that up right now mm -hmm. before they're gonna charge money for it and only half of them did that of course no one listens to me <laughs> jesse uh but uh we're, we're gonna get in there uh, and uh, none of us have like been paying much attention to it. i think we're like hey we kind of want to react uh, uh kind of raw to see what this game is like but what i want now from you is a pro tip do you have something that can give me an edge uh, to like uh, make me look good when i go in there and play the game Ooh, um i think if you're the camera person if you're the one holding the camera like really focus in on that youtuber mentality like try okay. to get an intro from them and try to get them to like really buy into the we are youtubers because i think that like one it makes for a better video and two i think it gets everybody sort of on board in this mindset of like yeah let's like make this a fail comp right like let's 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 get silly let's get goofy it loosens everybody up because mm -hmm. uh, otherwise it's you're just at the whims of whatever happens. There are real no pro tips in this game. <laughs> that, that sounds good, although I have a strong feeling they're not going to let me have the camera after the last time I had anything in uh, Lethal <laughs> Company, and I just kept hitting them with stuff. So we'll see. We'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, all right, let's explain what we do here. Most weekdays, I, Jeff Grubb, will help piece your gaming life back together. That includes breaking news and maybe even some of our own original reporting. 
for all these topics. I'll get the input of a bona fide expert who will make me look smart. If you are watching live on Twitch, welcome. You can always listen to the show later on podcast feeds by searching for Game Mess Mornings or find the RSS on GiantBomb.com. You can also catch the show later with chapters and timestamps on YouTube. Hello, YouTube. All right, we have a lot to get into, and let's not anger the gods and cause another earthquake and start the morning mess with the Assassin's Creed dev thinks industry is dropping 60 frames per second standard. Again, basically, this is from Hugh Langley at Tech Radar, and it is going to be a dregs day. We got a lot of stories like this. Everybody, just just roll with it. Yeah. Assassin's Creed Unity is the first game in the franchise to be built from the ground up for for the new gen consoles, uh, and Ubisoft has confirmed it will run. Why is why is it? Oh, is this? Yeah, okay, yeah. This is like kind of a, a them like calling back to an older uh, story here. Uh, at Ubisoft, for a long time, we wanted to push 60 frames per second. I don't think it was a good idea because you gain that much from 60 frames per second. It doesn't look like the real thing. It's a bit like the Hobbit movie. It looked really weird. This is this is uh, them so kind of calling back to conversations that have happened before and now pointing back to the fact that we're here kind of again on the, in this generation, Jesse, where developers are trying to come back and say, hey, hey, we yes, we were pushing 60 frames per second through the first part of this generation, but maybe that's going to come to an end again. And that's happened before. It did happen with Assassin's Creed Unity. And now we are seeing many games come out like Hellblade 2 that are saying to uh, gamers, hey, on your console, only expect 30 frames per second. You may have got used to 60 frames per second, but we are going to pull back from that. Do you think that that is something that, like when Assassin's Creed Unity came out, that people will be like, uh, you know, what choice do I have? We just have to accept it. Or do you think things have changed at all in, in regards to people's expectations for how games will run? I, I think it's interesting because I, I feel like we have the frame rate conversation all the time, all the time. like constantly. Yeah. And it's like some people don't bother. Some people don't mind it and other people like it's it's the end of the world to them. But we go through this every console cycle where it's like towards the end of a console cycle, like new GPUs are coming out and they're going to leapfrog the current consoles and they're going to do things that the current consoles can't do. And then the next gen refresh comes out and it's like, okay, now we're on par, if not maybe a little bit better than the current GPUs and we can do 60 again. And then technology advances and we just constantly do this leapfrog over one another. And so I, I feel like this is just the way that it is until, I don't know, maybe we find a tool set that can do, can push things and do 60. But think about how many games this generation have come out where it's like, do you want frame rate or do you want performance? Like, uh, do you want frame rate or do you want, uh quality right like fidelity and i think that's just kind of the way it is like you're buying consoles at a cheaper price than you would build a pc and like your pc is always going to be the one that could probably do both yeah but... and i'm I, I think um when i when i think about it um when i see a game like hellblade 2 i'm initially like yeah it looks really good i understand the 30 frames per second and i, I then i do like look around a little bit i'm like yeah but you know, Spider-Man looks really good, and they have an, uh, they have the option for 60 frames per second. And uh, Horizon, um, a game that, you know, I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of the Horizon games, but I think they look visually stunning in terms of their uh, visual quality. And yet those those also have a 60 frames per second mode. I'm like, and games don't need to look much better than that. I don't need Hellblade 2, actually, to look much better than those games. And yeah. yet what they, they must be doing something to push it so hard that it cannot run at 60 frames per second, even on the Xbox Series X. And um, I'm, I'm wondering personally, am I going to notice that difference compared to any of these games that look great that do have 60 frames per second mode? And I, personally, I probably won't, actually. I will. I, but I will notice 30 versus 60. Um, mm -hmm. And yet. We've had this conversation a million times, as you alluded to, Jesse, and it's always ending up back here. And, and really, I think at the beginning of this generation, uh, I was certainly fooling myself a little bit where I, I was like, oh, yeah, this will be the, the, the generation we'll have 60 frames per second pretty much the entire time. And it was it, that was wrong. That was incorrect. That was never going to happen. And he, so here we are and I, I, Hellblade 2 coming out and actually not having a 60 frames per second mode shouldn't be too surprising to me. I just wish I could see it on the screen. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I and I think it also is like a big thing. It's like everyone plays games on different TVs and different like I play on like a smaller monitor. So like most point. of the time I don't notice that stuff. Right. Because I'm like. Not that my monitor is bad or anything, but it's like I'm not playing all, all the time on like a 4K 55 inch TV that can like really, you know, pull the colors and pull everything. And so to me, I'm always somebody who kind of likes the 60 frames option because it's something I would notice more yeah. than the density. And sometimes games like Horizon 
are so visually dense that like it it hurts my eyeballs to look at for long periods <laughs> sure, of yes. time yes absolutely uh I uh, I think and that the point you just made there, though, uh, actually, I don't think can be overlooked, although it's something that we do because it's like, well, that's variable between person to person. So how do you even have that conversation? But um, uh, like Final Fantasy seven rebirth, there were people, the people like, hey, no, I, I played on a uh, performance mode and it looked pretty much fine to me. And I really liked having the 60 frames per second. And other people were like that looks like Vaseline. And I think we're like these people just see things different. But the, the likely difference is probably the person who's seen the Vaseline is playing on a 65 inch 4K TV that they sit five feet away from in their gamer chair, like leaning forward and looking at on this at the screen. Mm -hmm. You would see the drop in resolution at that point. You would see sort of the the the, the, the temporal anti-aliasing softening the edges of all of all these models um, if you're up close on that. But if you sit back from your from your TV. Uh, th those d minute details would get lost really fast. And the thing you can still notice from a distance is resolu or is uh, a frame rate. So how does a, de a developer account for all these things? I think at the end of the day, they are doing the thing that when they look at the numbers, when they look at what they need for marketing, amping, amping up visual quality and turning up and making sure that the screenshots look as, as, uh, as crisp as possible is probably still the thing that sells games better than saying it has a 60 frames per second mode. And so if I'm someone who prioritizes 60 frames per second, it's I think it's going to keep getting lost in the shuffle as we get further yeah. in these console generations. Absolutely. Uh, all right. Uh, moving along here. FTC temporarily denies ESRB application for face scan tech. This is from Grace Benfell at GameSpot. The Federal Trade Commission has denied an application from the Entertainment Software Rating, Ratings Board concerning face scanning age verification tech developed by the digital identity firm Yoti. Uh, in its response, the FTC rejected the application 4-0 to zero after receiving over 350 comments. The rejection is not meant to comment on the merits of the application. Rather, it is an anticipation that addition, additional information will be available to assist the commission and the public in better understanding age verification technologies and the application. Essentially, the FTC is punting on a final decision until more information is available. In a letter to the ESRB, the FTC noted that Yoti submitted a facial, facial estimation model to the National Institute of Standards and Technology and that a report on the tech from the Institute is forthcoming. The ESRB previously requested that the application get a 90-day delay to make time for the NIST's report release. The FTC opted instead to allow the ESRB to refile once the report emerges. So I hear... Uh, in my home face scanning tech to tell how old my kids are so they could play a game or not. Uh, and I don't like any of that. And I'm like, I mean, we should just deny that on its face because that seems uh, unnecessary for one and very invasive for for the second part. And then I hear, oh, so let's see, why are they denying it? And it's like, well, they're, it's just bureau bureaucratic shit. It's just they're just waiting yeah. to get uh, this this report so they can feel like they've done their due diligence. But it doesn't seem like there's much actual pushback against this uh i hate this jesse how do you feel about it um yeah no it's not great i don't like the idea that i, I mean like look i as a i don't really my if a camera wants to look at me and be like oh here's my ugly mug that's fine but I, it's it's invasive it's weird like if they're using it for that what else are they using it for where are they selling your data where are they doing x y oh, and yes. z right it gets it gets super complicated super quick and i know people all the time are like oh well like everyone's you know your phone's always listening to you and and your your webcam some people put tape over their webcam because they're afraid it's like watching them or whatever this is just them saying the quiet part out loud they're like no we are doing that we are yeah. we are actually going to just scan your face mm -hmm. uh and that I don't like that. That creeps me out. Yeah, and I and I um I have a different take than the ESRB on what my kids can play. Um I'm gonna yeah. let them play scary games as they get when they get a little bit older here, and I'm gonna let them play violent games when they get a little bit older here. I am gonna be there right next to them as as their dad, figuring that that, that out with them. Um I'm I'm a kid who definitely watched like scary R rated movies uh when I was younger, and I um you know, the, uh, as a parent now, I've like done a lot of reading on this and there's a lot of like child psychologists who are like, yeah, there's some value to that. There's some value to having a kid watch movies that are out of their age range a little bit earlier. Uh, that doesn't mean I'm like telling everyone, hey, go show your kids Jaws. Uh, but, you know, maybe maybe show your 11 year old Jaws. I bet that would be better than, than you would think. Um, 
And also, you know your kid. You know if they're going to be the kind of kid that's going to have nightmares and that they shouldn't see something. And it's very easy to sort of pull the plug on that before that happens. And then if they are interested in the subject and they, and you're like, hey, maybe we can watch this together, maybe would or play this together. I want that option. And I suppose that there would be they, they would say that there's overrides and stuff like that. So if like the parent is there, you can then turn it on and then let the kid take over. Uh, I just hate the idea of having to ask permission. <laughs> Like that's crazy to me. Yeah. Just let me do what I'm doing in my own home. I I don't know. I I don't and I don't know why we think we need this. I, I honestly, Jesse, I think you. The only reason that I think they think we need this is to do the other part, which is the tracking who's playing, like having a camera pointed at the at the couch from the TV, so they can gather that data and then sell it. That seems to be the whole point, and not actually protecting anyone from video games. Yeah, I see the marketing report right now where it's like. Oh, we've noticed that kids under the age of 11 are playing Resident Evil because we have all this data to now back it up by all this facial scan stuff that it's like, oh, these kids are are now playing this game or, or whatever, right? Yeah. Uh, and like you said, it's – as a parent, you know what your kid can and cannot handle, and you are, like, going to be there with them and, and you know, go on that journey with them together. And the fact that, like, they could potentially just, like – try to play a game and then like a camera has to scan them like maybe you're not home or something right and they want to play something and it's like yeah you can't do that and it's like oh but my dad said i could and it's like the, the camera doesn't know that the camera yeah. doesn't care if your chat told you you could or not like it, it is what it is it's weird yeah and uh you know i think we have the, a lot of these um par parenting apps that like let you control your kids devices and, and uh th this is something i'm kind of just breaching for the first time really because mm -hmm. up until this point um they really couldn't do much on their own they needed me to like be there for everything and so i could like see what they were doing or i would give them the amazon fire tablet that has the kids mm -hmm. mode and it's like you know you're you're constrained by this you're not going to get outside these walls so just go ahead and you can do whatever you want you can't hurt yourself um but I, I, I'm like, as I like just start downloading, like I gave my kid one of my old phones, it's just an old straight up Android phone with like, you know, a, you know with a vanilla Android on it. And I'm like, I think this probably has like a, a, a parenting app on it that I can control. And I found that and it was very easy to set up. And it was very easy to set up parameters for like, hey, you can only use this specific app, YouTube. You can use that for fucking 15 minutes. I'm sick of these unboxing videos from these weirdos. <laughs> 15 minutes is all you get. And then the phone is going to turn off after an hour and a half of use on, on any day on the weekend or something like that. And I, I, that's, I'm like, that is all, all makes sense. I just don't need the ESRB that only got, came into existence in the first place because g video game companies didn't want the government to come into uh, and right. stop them from doing uh, doing what they were doing and stop them from selling games in stores unless people had IDs or whatever. They're like, no, we'll handle it ourselves. The government doesn't yeah, need to come and intervene. And so for them to be like, we're going to be the ones now intervening in, on people playing games is just such an overstep of like, what do you think this is, ESRB? What the ESA? What do you what do you think this was that you like? You're you're actually protecting people. Don't come on. Yeah, those ratings are a little bit useful, but everyone who's like really buying games for the most part kind of understands what they're getting most of the time. And there is the occasional parent buying stuff for their kids that maybe finds that that letter helpful. But at the end of the day, this is really about protecting you from government oversight. That's what this always was. So the idea that you think you can now step in and help me in my in my home somehow, like, let's, come on, fuck off. I do not need this. So I hope that, that at, at once they like actually have the real hearing about this, because it just sounds like they were like, this wasn't the real hearing. We'll wait till there's more uh, data here, uh, that there is this strong commentary period. And now that people have had a chance to hear what, what is being considered, uh, this just gets shut down because no thank you. Yeah, it's just a massive overstep on their part. Like you said, like, it's like, what do they think they're doing here? What do they think they're protecting when it's like you only exist to keep the government at arm's length from yep. from the industry? Yeah, it's uh, uh, it's pretty absurd uh, on their part. Yes. Uh, and this next story actually kind of plays into this a little bit, uh, definitely into the data collection side of thing. Roku's new HDMI tech could show ads when you pause your video game. This is from Zach Swizen at Kotaku. Uh, shouts to Zach. A new patent recently yeah. filed by TV and streaming device manufacturer Roku hints toward a possible future where televisions could display ads when you pause a movie or game. For Roku, the time in which the TV is on but users aren't doing anything is valuable. The company has started leasing out ad space in its popular Roku City screensaver, which appears when your TV is idle, to companies like McDonald's and movies like Barbie. 
uh, that's to, who's uh, buying those ad spaces. As tech newsletter, newsletter Lowpass points out, Roku finds this idle time and its screensaver so value, valuable that it forbids app developers from overriding the screensaver with their own. But if you plug in an Xbox or DVD player into an HDMI port on a Roku TV, you bypass the company's screensaver and other ads. And so Roku has been figuring out a way to not let that happen. As reported by Lopass on April 4th, Roku recently filed a patent and a for, for a technology that would let it inject ads and into third-party content like an Xbox game or Netflix movie using an HDMI connection. The patent describes a situation where you are playing a video game and hit pause to go check your phone or grab some food. Food. At this point, Roku would identify that you have paused the content and display a relevant ad until you unpause the game. Um, man, God damn it! <laughs> why, why, why are we here? Why is this is the worst timeline? It's really, it really does suck. Um, I again, look, I understand that these TVs are in a way subsidized by uh, them being able to sell ads on it, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, who? That's your problem. The company that. The, if I plug something into my, to an HDMI port, I want it to work like, hey, I have full control over this stack. I and and then just because I pause my game does not give you the right. Like I'm not necessarily just pausing it to look at my phone. I could be pausing it for other reasons to like stop and look at something on the screen or or like consider something in my um in, in my inventory. And just because I'm not moving the stick doesn't mean I want, don't want to be seeing what's on the screen. The idea that they think they could take that over to sell me something is absurd. And it, it really feels like using uh, what, what was once considered the benefits of HDMI, HDMI technology, where it's like, hey, it's a smart connection. The, the, you know, the, the TV and your speakers can all understand kind of what's happening. And they're like, okay, well, how can we use this to our advantage? And here we are. I, Jesse, let me ask you, do you think this actually gets implemented? Or, or do you think this is just like one of those patents that will come and go? It, it's hard to say because I absolutely see a world in where this happens for at least a little bit. Yeah. It reminds me a lot of um, – was it like a couple months ago where Xbox was doing that thing where like suddenly like a full screen ad would show up on like the homepage and it was for like Call of Duty or whatever. That sounds right, yeah. There, there was something when going you, like, on. Definitely when you would just start it up, yeah. It reminded me of it, this. Is like feels like the next, like the natural, like extension of that, where it's like, oh well, like where is the idle time? Where can we serve more ads? Because you get these Roku TVs. Like I have one in my in my living room. I have like the TCL or whatever, right? And they're they're pretty cheap TVs and they're yeah, good TVs. They're, they're good TVs. But like this feels like this is like this is what it's been building to. It's like oh, we can just shove this TV full of ads, and anytime we could put ads down, like that's what we'll do. And so I could see this happening. Be maybe be major backlash happening and them revoking it. But I do think they try because it seems like it seems like something they would try. I mean, they're already selling ads on the screensaver part of it. Yep. Why not sell ads wherever they can? I'm curious to see if this does go through and this starts happening. If developers have to start thinking about how their pause screen is laid out, if ads are just going to take over yeah. parts of the pause Jesus, screen, yeah. it becomes like a whole new layer of like, oh, how well, how do we develop this now? Yeah, I, and it's uh, the kind of thing where it's like if it if it becomes popular, you're right. They would just be it would be built into the UX design um, where they're like, yeah, we know that there's going to be an ad served here either from Roku. But if Roku does it, then like the Xbox and and PlayStation probably would get in on it too, and they would probably start serving ads when you pause yeah. the game and be like, this is just standard practice, and so we're going to have multiple ads here. Um, uh, yeah, I, it does kind of stink that we have sort of returned back to this well of advertising kind of being pervasive. Um, I, uh, you know, we, we grew up in a time where I was watching, you know, cable television. And uh, so I just was con constantly bombarded with advertisements. And one of the benefits of getting these streaming services and, and, and then playing video games and reading books and doing stuff like that and like kind of having a medium, uh, a, a diet that cut out advertisement was I was seeing fewer ads. And now my, yeah. my kids grow up in a world where advertisements like that I grew up with look very strange to them. They, it, that is not something that they are uh, seeing very, like they go weeks without seeing a television advertisement. Um, right. And so, but we, we see where things are headed, right? We, we know Netflix is, has a, that ad supported tier and Amazon Prime Video, uh, I've, I've started getting more and more ads as I mm -hmm. watch more and more shows on Prime Video. Uh, it's back. It's here. They're, they're, they're putting it into the streaming stuff. Um, and even like, and I pay for the ad free tier on a lot of stuff, but that's starting to get really expensive. And I'm like looking at Prime Video, I'm like, man, I, do I want to pay for another uh, uh, you know, ad, ad free tier? I don't know. 
And so like advertisements are starting to sneak back into everything. So I'm not too surprised by this, but it does it does bum me out that like, hey, I always associated with like video games as a place where I can go and get away from that stuff. And I pay a pretty hefty price for a video game out of the gate most of the time so that I can feel like I have ownership over this experience and you don't need to bombard me with ads. And yet so they're still creating new technologies so they could do exactly that. And in a way, it feels inevitable to me, Jesse. They, if this doesn't work, it'll be something else. They will find a way exactly. to get more ads into more of our stuff, right? Yeah, and it's it, this style of ad seems may, way more invasive than a lot of other styles where it's like, oh, an ad comes on while I'm watching TV, yep. oh, that kind of sucks. But this is like, oh, this was constructed specifically because we know that there is maybe 15, 30, 40 seconds of time that you put your controller down yep. and we can just start flashing ads at you. And it's like, it's gross. It feels bad. Like I, sometimes you just, you just want to like unplug a little bit and just play a game Yep. and you're paying, like you said, you're paying a lot of money for the game. You're playing a lot of money for the console. You paid a lot of money for the TV. And now it's like, Oh, actually you're going to get ads for the rest of your life now. And it's like, what are we doing here? Yeah, I, I think um, I, I want to feel like there are times when I can just go be uh, not not alone, but, but be myself and not feel like I uh, there's constant external pressures trying to force me into making purchasing decisions. Uh, I want yeah. to like exist in like some pockets where I could do that. And if I'm paying money up front to have these entertaining, entertaining experiences, my expectation is okay, I could sit here and there isn't some algorithm in the background trying to figure out the best way to get me to buy those sneakers I looked at on Instagram. Uh, it it mm -hmm. is, it, it, and so the idea that they are gonna have these moments where they know when I'm pausing, and then if they can combine that with a few of these other factors of, well, you know, the Xbox talks to the TV, they do know if I set down the controller, maybe, maybe, maybe the Xbox could tell the TV that, and then they can use that information about how long of an ad they show me. And then they're, yeah. they're buying my data and they, and they know what I'm watching on the Roku TV. I'm, they know what apps I'm using. They could pr probably track what shows I'm watching inside of those apps. They can probably see if I ever watch any of the free TV television channels that they have streaming to the TV and know what kind of, I go to Comet TV and I watch old sci-fi stuff. Just listen, I, I don't mind targeted advertising so much. I just want the opportunity to get away from it. I want to go to a movie theater, pay my pay for my, my ticket, go in and watch the movie and have two and a half hours where no one's trying to target me for ads once I'm in there. Yeah. And if they were to start inserting ads into that, I'd be what, what like especially targeted ads, I just it would feel like you can never escape capitalism ever. And I just want a few re 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 respites, uh, place oasis away from the constant bombardment. Um, so this just, it feels like a slippery slope that we're going to find more and more ways to uh, sully the that that escape. And it, it just bums me out. And here we are. Yeah. Between these two stories, it's just, you know, how invasive can we be in your home to get your data and advertise to you? And it's like, that sucks. <laughs> it really sucks. It's, yeah. ugh. Yeah, it, it, like the guy, they, they talk about it in the story right here. The company also proposes using HDMI CEC which is that consumer electronics control that so when like that's what when you like turn on your PlayStation 5 and it turns on your TV mm -hmm. and your sound bar and stuff that's what CEC is but that means these devices are smart can talk to each other and give each other data about what's going on and so that that's what they would use to figure out when you've paused your game uh, so if you've ever used like the remote control to control like for your TV to control your PlayStation 5 to like watch shows it's all that all that stuff can now be used against you to advertise to you um uh, we'll see. I, I guess, you know, the thing is with a, with a patent, uh, Roku might be the only ones able to do this. Of course, other companies would likely find other ways that would be, uh, you know, uh, be free of this patent to do it themselves, or they could license the patent from Roku. But if Roku's the only one doing it, I think that would make uh, their their products a little bit less enticing to people. And maybe people would just say, I'll choose this one that is promising not to advertise to me. Um, or maybe Roku and all these companies will all do it and they will sell ad free tiers on your television and you can give them extra money not to be advertised to. And that just also sounds like a goddamn nightmare. Yeah, gross. Uh, all right. Mobile game Star Wars Galaxy of Heroes is getting an enhanced PC port. This is from Chris Scullion at VGC. Popular mobile game Star Wars Galaxy of Heroes is coming to PC later this year. EA originally released the game in November 2015 and has continued to enjoy a following in the eight and a half years since. While players have used various methods like Android emulation to play the game on PC, EA is now giving the game an official PC port. As reported by Game Informer, the PC version of Galaxy of Heroes will feature options for higher resolution and will support anti-aliasing and will double the frame rate to 60 frames per second. 
Um, this is only a little bit interesting to me, Jesse. I guess my bigger question here for something like this is, uh, would you be someone who would be more willing to play uh, uh, mobile games more frequently if they showed up on devices that you use more frequently? Or are you someone who play, does play a lot of mobile games? Um, I guess this is the part where I have to admit that I am an avid Monopoly Go player. Yeah, okay, I've been looking for one. What, I, you got me. How did they get you, and how do you find, like, what is the game like, and, and why do you keep returning to it? Okay, uh, I had to play it when I was at Primo. It was like a guides thing, so okay. I, had to, I had to jump in there. So I was like, I'll, I'll give it a try. Uh, they keep me around because it's it's just mindless. Mm -hmm. It's just I click the thing, I roll the dice, my guy goes around the board, and I just get money. And it's like, wow, this is – I'm winning capitalism this time. <laughs> um, and I keep coming back because I'm so close to being like – I guess what you would call like patch current. Like I'm just so close to the end, and I've never reached the end of a mobile game. Like I've never reached the point where I'm waiting for a mobile game update. And that, so I'm like, I have to, I have like to a, reach that a point. level of Zen. I could never imagine. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I just keep playing it. And like, it takes me like 20 minutes every day. I do my little, like I roll my dice. I, you know, I, I do like the little activities and there's always events and stuff and it's fine. Um, but I'm just so close to the end. I just have to. I have to know what it's like to be like. All right, I gotta. I gotta go to Scopely's website and like find out when is that next update coming. When's the new Monopoly board coming out? Um, but that's the only mobile game I play. Okay. Uh, I'm not a big mobile person outside of that. Um, I give things a try here and there, like Marvel Snap. I was big on for a minute and, Same. and other things. But I never. I never played the Marvel Snap like PC version and like i hear that that it's like fully out now it's like a full version it's not just like a weird right the, version the, of the so mobile they, game the, the, well, yes they like they like made it like work better for being on pc and, and widescreens and stuff like that yes so i don't know if i would particularly like try something i wasn't already playing on mobile right um especially a game like galaxy of heroes that's just like not my style of mobile game sure and so it's cool like i always love more options for people uh and some people will probably try it out for pc uh as opposed to mobile because a lot of people don't either one they don't want to burn their battery they don't have the time on mobile like they're doing other things or or they're just on the go and uh, mobile games are hard sometimes like you're, i can't even play them on the subway half the time because i lose connection so oh it's like, yeah uh, that, yes totally yes and that's that's frustrating i i am um there's the occasional game where I'm like, when I hear it's like, hey, it's a mobile game, and we're also going to release it on the Switch, like that Zynga Star Wars shooter that still hasn't come out. I'm like, oh yeah, oh yeah, I'll one. check that on the Switch, a free to play Star yeah. Wars shooter that's like made made for mobile, but they're going to release it on the Switch, so it's probably going to run fine because they're making it for mobile. That sounds mm -hmm. fine. I, I I'll give that a shot. I bet I'm not going to like it, but at least I'm more likely to give it a shot than if it was just on mobile. And then um, there, is, uh, there is like those uh, MiHoYo games uh, that you yeah. know are both console and PC and uh, and mobile. At least they're on like PlayStation, and it's like I think those blow up in a bigger way because they are thinking about making it. Yeah, they're mobile games. They think about making them for PC and, and console, and that seems to make them more substantive. So substantive, and I think that uh, people are uh, like, when they go to play it on mobile, they're like, these feel like big, real games, because they are. They have to make them that way, because they're competing with all these other games that have uh, you know, established themselves as strong RPGs. So you can't just be like, you can't just be mindless in that in that case you have to have a lot going on and so i think there's always a benefit when these mobile games consider these other platforms and for me i, I think i'm someone who would occasionally check out like one out of every 100 of these here and there uh but you're right the star wars galaxy of heroes a pc port pro i'm probably not going to hop on that i think i played it a little bit when it launched um i want to say it's kind of like uh clash royale a little bit maybe or or i, the, I know it's like characters sitting on the side and maybe they're like fighting and taking turns fighting so maybe not clash royale it's like an auto it's like an auto battle auto battle oh, that's that's what it was yes exactly um and you know i i like seeing like you know han solo han solo and a bunch of weird jedi standing next to each other yeah. like throwing attacks well sure maybe if it was on like switch maybe I'd be like oh yeah that's weird I'll, I'll i'll check that out uh but i'm not like rushing to rushing to try this um but i do think this is something that becomes more common as we go forward, uh, especially as like mobile uh, mobile devices are more powerful than ever, um, I think they're like the the kinds of game design that will thrive and have a chance to break out will be the games that maybe do feel like they could be they, they, this could just be a console game if it had a few changes here and there because everything that is built for just mobile and for that audience that audience is already pick, playing their game if it's not. Uh, Candy Crush, if it's not a handful of other games, if it's not Clash Clash of Clans or Clash Royale, 
it is Mo Monopoly Go is like the one new one that has been able to break through. But most of the time, all these other games uh, have are, the, the audiences have already picked their game and they're not looking for some new thing to distract them. They want to just keep going back to their game. So I think having a game that can be like uh, bringing in an audience that has been playing games for a long time in other places is probably a strong strategy. I think and MiHoYo has definitely proven that. So it's funny you brought up MiHoYo because I don't even think of them as like mobile right because i i've only ever experienced their games on and console I think it's or pc a, I think it's i've never thought benefit, about right? it mm -hmm. it's like this. because there are millions of mobile players like yeah. they, they have a huge audience there but like the console players and the pc players don't consider it mobile and the mobile players don't consider it but they're both like hey this is a good version of the thing i am playing right uh for windship asking what the hell is me ho yo uh it's uh uh, uh honkai star rail and genshin impact, genshin impact. Uh, so and Zen was Zone Zero later out later this year apparently. Yep. And these games They're are action games. massively popular, massively popular. So, yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, you know what? Let's take a quick break. When we get back, we got a few more headlines to get to right after this. All right, we are back, and Relic has announced the layoffs following its split from Sega. This is from Tom Ivan at VGC. Uh, part of the uh, 2024 layoff train here. Uh, a week after being sold by Sega and becoming an independent studio, Relic Entertainment has announced a new round of layoffs. While the company hasn't publicly put a number on the amount of affected employees, Relic internal development producer Robin Small said that the studio had lost a number of amazing people uh, around 41. Uh, Vancouver based Vancouver, Canada based Relic specializes in real time strategy games, including Company of Heroes, Age of Empires and Homeworld. Letting people go was not an easy decision and was made solely with the goal of providing Relic the best possible chance to survive in an increasingly volatile industry. It does not in any way reflect the expertise, passion or character of any of the impacted employees. Um, yeah, this is this is one where it's like when a company has to spin off from their parent company just to survive because it's like, you know, I, I get the idea that the options are, hey, do you want to like spin off and try to like purchase this thing with with funding however you want from Sega and go and go be on your own? Or do you want us to shut you down and lay lay everybody off? It feels like those are the options. Yeah. So then being like, OK, you know what? We'll find a way to spin off from Sega and keep the studio alive. And that if that's going to mean layoffs after that. I'm a little bit more understanding. This continues to suck though. This industry is in a really weird place. And if you're a studio like Relic, where you're making real-time strategy games and the last thing you did was that Age of Empires game that people liked, but maybe it's like, yeah. God, if it's not blowing up way bigger than anyone thought it would, it does it even make sense to make these games anymore? And I, uh, my answer is, I don't know. It feels like I understand the volatility here and I understand why they're doing this, but man, it still stinks. How do you feel about it, Jesse? In in the in the last two years, the amount of layoffs we have seen it just like increases and increases. And every time I read like this was not an easy decision, like regardless of where it's coming from, like I'm so sick of yep like reading those words because like yeah maybe it wasn't an easy decision for this this case because this was like a little bit of an outlier in the case of a lot of the industry layoffs we have seen. But it's just like it hurts, it sucks, yeah. it's it's like demoralizing on every front. It's like how do you how do, how do we like bounce back from any of this? Like we're just watching talented person after talented person lose their job. And there's too many people in the job market and not enough jobs available. And these, these studios are like tightening up and trying to like cut as many costs as they possibly can. And it's like, it's, it's rough. It's, it's rough out there for every single person in this industry. And it's only getting harder. Yep. And, and, and I, think I don't the, know what the answer is. Yeah. And it's like in the case of relic, you're like, okay, well, you've laid people off. You're more streamlined. Uh, get to work making games, and and hopefully it's all good news from here on out. But then it's like you look like they were acquired by a UK investment firm, you know, private capital, Amona Capital LLP. And it's like, God, that's that's the kind of entity that would take a studio like this and be like, yeah, do layoffs, and then we're gonna like we're gonna borrow a lot of money in your name, and we're gonna give ourselves some some bonuses, and good luck. After that, you guys can maybe put out a game, whatever. We don't care. We already gave ourselves some bonuses. So it's, um, I hope that this is not like the beginning of the end for a, a really talented developer like Relic. Company of Heroes, again, is, is a game that people adore. Uh, it, it, like for real time strategy fans, it was like this revitalization of the genre and uh, it had this really strong multiplayer component that people went back to for years and years and years. And the Company of Heroes 3 comes out and didn't do great. And that's sort of what has led us here. Um, 
but that doesn't mean they can't return to some glory if they, they can get those games put together. So, uh, yeah, J Jesse, I'd be, we've been, this parade of layoffs has been nonstop. Um, I, it does, I, I hope we, we get on the other side of it here pretty soon. But it, that, that even when we do, it doesn't feel like, oh, it's clear sailing. It's like, man, the video game industry is in for some gloomy time for a long time, right? Yeah, and because it, 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 it's cyclical, right, in, in so many ways. And every time we redo this cycle, we the, the industry looks different. The people yeah. in the industry look different. The games in the industry look different. The Just the general vibe of the industry looks different. And so, you know, when we do eventually get over this this hurdle, like, what what does it look like? What's left? Like, are... are are the talent that was there that made some of our favorite games in the last 10 years, are they even still around anymore? Like, were they able to, to make it through? Like we, we, we lose so many important people along the way that it's just, it's brutal. And then you have, you know, investment firms, hedge funds, VC, like coming in and buying up all this stuff and then just wanting them to churn out content. That's unsustainable. They want exponential growth. You can't get it. Like it's, it's real dire out here. Yep. Um, I hope I hope Relic's able to make it all make sense though. Uh, it's, a, it's a studio that deserves better. They, it's one of those studios that, when Sega was in their tar their dark period and they were like relying on PC development, uh, Relic and um, uh, I'm gonna, I, remember, I always want to say Certain Affinity. It is a CA developer. I can't remember what the, the actual Creative Assembly. Creative Assembly. Thank you. It's a, the, Certain Affinity always gets in my head instead. <laughs> uh, Creative Assembly. It's like these are studios that put out games that was keep, keeping Sega afloat because they were like, hey, our PC games are growing and they're massive and they're doing really well. And Sonic keeps fucking up. Why don't we don't know what's going on over there? Uh, and then you know, years later, they started figuring out a lot of stuff. You know, maybe not with with, uh, with Sonic, but with Yakuza and stuff like that. And it's like they've established this uh, a new identity. Um, but then for them to kind of discard these studios that were keeping them afloat when they didn't have much else going on continues to be very frustrating to me. It's like Sega, you maybe should be a little bit more uh, loyal to these people that kept you afloat when things weren't great. Uh, all right. Uh, Here's a report that Yuma, Yuma Miyaki is stepping down as the producer on Dragon Quest. This is from Sophie McAvoy at GamesIndustry.biz. Um, Yu Miyaki is allegedly moving from his role as producer on the Dragon Quest series to another position within Square Enix. This is according to Bloomberg, who was told by sources that Miyaki would be overseeing the firm's smartphone games division instead. Near Automata producer y Yosuke Saito is allegedly being considered to take over Miyaki's role. Sources said this move is part of Square Enix's restructuring plan, which reportedly began on April 1st. GamesIndustry.biz Games Industry reached out to Square Enix for comment. Uh, Miyaki has been the producer on the Dragon Quest series since 1992, with his latest credit on Dragon Quest Monsters The Dark Prince released in 2023. Restructuring plans were previously announced by Square Enix's president, Takashi Kiryu, last November. Kiryu cited the limited diversity of its lineup of games, adding that he wanted to structure its development function so that we are able to ensure higher quality from each title. Um, th th this also seems to come out of, hey, Dragon Quest, uh, where are they at? They, they did uh, 11. I think it's the next yeah, one. Yeah, they have 12 announced. 12 announced. And I think 12 is taking a little bit longer than they were expecting it to, to take. It's feel, this feels like it's part of that as well. Are are you you're are you a Dragon Quest guy? I know you're I know you're an RPG guy. Uh, is this a series yeah. that you've been paying attention to? What do you feel about this? I pay attention to Dragon Quest, like sort of on the periphery. Like I played yeah. eleven and liked it a lot, but I have not done like my deep dive the way I've done with like a Final Fantasy or something. There's sure. just so many of them. Um, this kind of like fits in line, I feel, with like a lot of what Square does all the time, right? Like they have their creative business units and they they move people around and I I mean it makes sense to me. It's like, hey, this guy is doing great stuff. Put him, put him over here, right? Yeah, maybe. Uh, it's just, I. It's hard to tell because it's like Square is always kind of so cagey about some of their stuff that it's like, I, I don't know. I just, I, I, I don't know a lot about this yet because we have yet to see what this could mean for the future. And Dragon Quest Twelve is coming out eventually, right? We and don't it's know. Switching yeah. to action, it's not turn based this time around, so it's like. They might be having to figure that out for a while. Um, I don't know. It's it's a tough one for me. It's it's like I don't I don't really know what this means until we kind of see it happen. Yes, I I think um, uh, someone in the chat pointed out uh, that uh, you know for a Japanese company going from uh, producing Dragon Quest to overseeing all the mobile games, that, that's actually maybe a step up. Uh, uh, but this is born out of, of Square Enix saying. 
uh, that they want to increase. They want to make better games. They said that's what they said a couple months ago. It's like starting on April first, we are going to change things up so we make our games better. Um, now, I think that usually meant like we're actually just going to spend a little bit more time on some of these games. And, but uh, clearly, it also means that they're shifting around some of the uh, the leadership responsible for their franchises. Um, I I wonder if they were, are looking around at the uh, their other you know um, cohort publishers like Capcom and seeing like how Capcom is able to turn many of its franchises and and uh, or to, to give many of its franchises that big glow up moment. Where they're like, hey, Dragon Quest or Dragon's Dogma 2 is here and it's massive and it's going to sell way faster than the first one. And uh, hey, here's a remake of an old Resident Evil game that sold well. And now the remake is selling this much better. And I think they're like, hey, why can't that happen for Dragon Quest? Um, uh, and, and honestly, why can't it happen for Final Fantasy? Final Fantasy's had had like some ups and downs in, ter in terms of its sales numbers. So they're, I think they're like, what are we doing wrong? We probably have to change something up. Uh, but I, I I don't know. Do you, do you think that there be able, they they have the capacity to uh, change Dragon Quest? Do you think like them changing to action game is that enough, or are they gonna have to do something more to find a new audience with Dragon Quest? It's it's interesting because like Dragon Quest right is like is like the staple right. It is the blueprint for so long, but at a certain point, it like it got outshone by by other RPGs, and it's still there. And it's still got like a core audience to it, but. I think action is like the first step because we we saw this with sixteen, right? Like sixteen was like we're going hard action, Final Fantasy, and like we're 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 changing it up, and like it did all right for them. I don't really know how well that that shift did for them overall yet. Yeah, but like maybe that's what Dragon Quest needs. the The only like image we have of Dragon Quest twelve is just kind of like the logo, and it, it seems like it has a darker tone. So like maybe that's what they're trying to do is like maybe we go like a little bit edgier, we go a little bit darker, and maybe that gets us a new audience. But I don't know what dragon quest would have to do to get a new audience because i think the audience it has is so like it's it, it's a fervor like they just love dragon quest dragon yeah. quest is a culture to them i, I, um, think, but I, I don't think know how you get a younger audience yeah i i but i think that they were, are on the right track with dragon quest 11 a game that i as someone yeah. who does not uh fall in love with jrpgs very easily really really enjoyed what i played of that game and i didn't play a ton but i was like uh, i was on uh paternity leave uh, a few years ago and uh i just was like, yeah, I'm going to start this game up. And I ended up playing like 15 hours just kind of accidentally after I was like, I'll just start it up, maybe play for an hour or two, see what it looks like. Because I thought it looked really nice. And then I played for a lot longer because it's a very enjoyable game. And I think that I think if a game like Dragon Quest XI came out now, I think it would do even better. I think the, the environment yeah. for that kind of game where you have an awesome cast of character, characters and it looks really nice and it's like, hey, we're leaning into being a JRPG. I think it would kind of be similar to what has happened with uh, Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth, where it's like and that's doing better than ever. And all the and Persona is doing better than, than ever. RPGs continue to grow. P audiences really want these character driven games. And I think if they sort of just leaned into that and like kept building on that side of things, uh, that they could see the growth that they have not seen so far because I just the audience has changed. So, um, I wish they would kind of just recognize that and lean into that. But here we are. We'll we'll see what Dragon Quest Eleven or Dragon Quest Twelve is able to do. Um, and it's it's possible that the shift to Dragon Quest Twelve is so far in a different direction that people don't like it. That when they return with back going back to like the 11 stuff yes. everyone it's celebrated and everyone's like Absolutely. this is what we've been looking for it gets all this this fan like fandom and like it it blows up the way it does but we'll see yep yep as uh as xx medusa lover 69 and chat says oh, the weeb yeah. stocks are up they're they're just, they just keep going up everybody to the moon uh all right last story here uh here's a look at a test run of the donkey kong ride at super nintendo world uh, this looks pretty cool. I'm going to play this here. I'm going to mute it here. Uh, but yes, this is from my Nintendo News. F footage of the first test runs of the upcoming Donkey Kong Country ride at Super Nintendo World at Universal Studios Japan have appeared online, and it looks like it's a blast. Uh, the, the ride opens soon and includes a new roller coaster called Minecart Madness, which will take riders through the jungle as Donkey Kong and Diddy Kong protect the Golden Banana from the Tiki Tack tribe, which sounds problematic, and even contains a yeah. leap across the collapsed track, which uh, that, apparently they're doing some cool new tech there to make it feel like you're actually you know crossing a collapsed track. Um, I think this looks yeah. pretty promising. It looks pretty cool. I, I kind of wish they would go a little bit further afield from Mario than Donkey Kong 
uh, but I understand that that's a pretty, uh, a pretty safe bet for them right now, and uh, they are leaning in on Donkey Kong, which they probably have like that movie coming, and it sounds like they're making some more Donkey Kong games. Uh, so yeah, this... Oh yeah, look at that jump right there. That's very cool. I don't know, what does this look like to you? Are you excited about something like this? Yeah, I mean, so I have not been to super any version of super nintendo world at all and i've been like i really want to go um are you going are you going I, I, out to to la for super summer game fest i am i am i, I might am, maybe I we might. Can, maybe we can make a track Ooh, the, na the nasty boys I, takes a super nintendo world i would like that'd be a lot of fun uh i would i would love to just go and see it but like i think the one thing i always get from all the like travel logs and footage i see from it is like it has a handful of rides but it doesn't have a ton and so I, I think adding just any any yes. more Mario sort of universe stuff you can put in there is really great. And like I like that they're going with Donkey Kong. I think like a minecart ride just makes sense. It right? does make a lot of sense. Like my um one of my favorite rides at, at Disney is is the Indiana Jones. Like you're you're going through the boulders coming down. You're going yep. right. Like Donkey Kong just fits that vibe. It makes so much sense. Like uh if they're trying out new tech with donkey kong that's cool because that means like when they pick some weirdo franchise that they're gonna pull to put in there like they've they're like oh we've been working on tech we're gonna do some real wild stuff with this thing over here uh when when we're, we're on yoshi's back and he's jumping over actual pits right and like there's mm -hmm. just the empty void below us stuff like that it's cool yep i got, so, no, I got no problems yeah so uh yeah the the universal in hollywood there's no way it's gonna get this there's just not enough room for them to put this in there but uh uh, you know that maybe they, they could expand Mario with like maybe one or two more things. Maybe that'd be great. Um, but this this will show up in uh, Orlando for sure. Uh, they've basically already started work on that. As far as I as far, I, I think I think in Orlando there is uh, rumors among uh, the, the the theme park watchers, uh, namely Mike Minotti, that they are already starting work on something that could easily turn into a Zelda ride. So or a Ooh. Zelda Land. So they're they're getting to work on all this stuff, and God, yeah. The more I look at this uh, this footage, the more I'm like, yeah, I, I think this would be a very good time, I, and it makes me want to play Donkey Kong Country. So there I am. Uh, all right, Jesse, that does it for the news. Let's get to the poll question, which should be right here. Let's go ahead and refresh that. Uh, there you go. Are you getting excited for the summer game mess? 42% say, I'll get excited when Sony, Microsoft, and Nintendo confirm shows. Then 30% say, no, E3 is dead. And 29% say, yes, I'm already excited. So there's kind of a kind of a mix there. Most people, though, are either already excited or ready to get excited once, you know, Nintendo announces a direct is actually going to happen. Microsoft already has confirmed their show, obviously. Sony is rumored to do something in May. I think they are doing something in May at probably a showcase. Um, but... You know, I don't blame people for being like, yeah, I'll, but I'll get excited when they say they're actually going to do that. How are you feeling about it, Jesse? But we do have Ubisoft confirmed, Microsoft confirmed, and then like this Sony rumor. Is that enough for you? You want to see a couple more things or, or you know, we're going to go out in L.A. and have a good time one way or the other. But how are you feeling about yeah. the showcases? Um, I'm feeling I'm feeling all right so far. I, I think I'm more interested than previous years to see what these companies have to show, because 2023 like certified banger year right like just so many great so much great stuff and this year is like it's feeling maybe like it might be a little lighter wait i don't know and so i'm more than ever interested to see what these companies are bringing so i'm i'm ready to be like okay what does the fall look like what does the holiday look like what does early next year look like like let, let's see it and i think nintendo more than anything like I'm like, okay, what are we what are we doing here? We got the Switch 2 stuff going on. We got, you know, you don't really have a lot for the rest of the year. Like, is this the year we see Metroid Prime 4? I don't know. And so, like, I'm ready to to really get in there and, and see what that stuff is all about. Yeah, I, I think a lot of it just comes down to how ready these companies are to talk about anything. Yeah. Um, I, I think that Microsoft has the potential to be very interesting if they're ready to update us on a lot of their already announced games. Uh, you know, uh, Indiana Jones obviously will be something they update us about because that's coming out later this year still. Uh, mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, Perfect Dark and uh, Avowed and Fable yeah. and, a, and a handful of other games they've already announced. And then, you know, I, I, th I do think they probably will have a Gear 6 at this show. If that's their, their showcase, that that's, sounds pretty good. Maybe it's a couple cool. other surprises. And, and then yeah. um, and then for like Nintendo, obviously it's like we and Nintendo and PlayStation where it's like Nintendo is um, in this you know transitionary period. So what will they have? What won't they have? They probably won't have most things uh, at, a, at a showcase this summer. And then PlayStation has already told us we're not going to have a lot of, of first party sequel games. But that doesn't mean they couldn't have like the new blue, uh, the blue, blue point game or, uh, yeah. you know, Concord 
uh, that one of, some of their live service games. Astrobot is one that, that I hear is, is probably going to happen later this year, and that's kind of you know that could work. Uh, there's a lot of stuff they could put in a showcase that would be very exciting still. And then of course they have like all their partner games that they've already announced as well. So yeah, I'm hopeful. Um, I, I and I don't need much these days to be like, well, that was that was worth it. I think if you give me a couple of games that are big and surprising, and then I'll give a lot of other developers a reason to come into town, into LA to show us firsthand what their stuff looks like. Uh, it was worth it last year. If it's about the same yeah. or or maybe a little bit bigger, uh, I think it'll definitely be worth it again this year. So looking forward to it. And boy, it, it really is upon us now. Just we got done with PAX and I yeah. started getting emails about Summer Game Fest and was like, no, mm -hmm. what are you talking about? And then I looked at the calendar. <laughs> it's yeah, two months away. We're basically there. We're right there. I'm all like, right. Oh, all right. I got to start planning a trip to L.A. All right. Yeah, let's make, make it happen, it's... nasty boys. Let's go. Yeah. Uh, all I'll right. There. I have another poll question, and we'll get to it here in a second. Before we do that, Jesse Fatelli, Young Elmo, why don't you tell people where they can find you on the internet, what you have going on, all that good stuff. All right. Uh, I'm Jesse Vitelli. If you want to contact me, do not. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Twitter, at Jesse Vitelli, Blue Sky, Instagram, whatever, whatever your social media of choice is, just find my name. I've made it so that I have the best SEO of any Jesse Vitelli out there on the internet. I am Google's number one Jesse Vitelli. <laughs> um, so you can find me wherever. Currently, I, I don't have a whole lot uh, going on uh, freelance-wise. However, uh, if you notice, Game Informer is doing those magazine subscriptions now, and you can get them on their website. Uh, my Dragon's Dogma 2 review will be in the magazine, so if you pick up next month's issue of the magazine, uh, you will get to see, you get to read my words on on pe a piece of paper, like, yeah. a, like a cave man. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's all I've got really going on. A whole lot of nothing. Excellent. Kind of uh, it. But if you are in, uh, out in LA, we'll definitely have have you over on the yeah. uh, GB at night. Looking forward to that. Uh, we'll be doing our uh, our typical three night thing. Uh, but yeah, plenty plenty of details to still to announce about all that. Everybody, so look out for that here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, real quick, want to shout out a, a story that Rebecca Valentine over at IGN just dropped uh, mm. with the title: How hidden Nazi symbols were the tip of a toxic iceberg at Life is Strange developer Deck Nine. This is looking pretty crazy here. Um, you know, I'll just read these first two paragraphs. Early last year, while working on the next entry in the Life is Strange franchise, a few developers at Deck Nine stumbled upon something that didn't belong in the game, Nazi symbols. Initially, developers noticed a reference to the number 88 and flagged the issue to their bosses, assuming it was an innocent mistake. But in the ensuing, ensuing weeks, others found more problematic signs and in in-universe labels, such as references to a racist meme, the number 18, and the Hegel rune. As the number of possible hate symbols mounted, staff grew increasingly concerned that someone was putting these items into their game deliberately as a dog whistle to white supremacists. Uh, there's a lot more to this story. Uh, Rebecca always it's, does it's fantastic work. So uh, go ahead and check that out, everybody. All right. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Yes, new poll question. What do you prefer? Higher resolutions or higher frame rates? Let's just, let's just have it. Let's have it out. Let's see right here what you prefer. And um, feel free to go in the comments and say, you know, give you give your uh, explained reason why you prefer what you do. I'm interested to see how many people are like, yeah, I do sit close enough to a, a really nice TV to see stuff. So I want the resolution. I want the quality. That stuff makes a difference to me. Um, or just, hey, if you're someone who doesn't see frame rates, let us know. I'm interested. We will discuss that on the show on Monday, which is the day of the eclipse. But I'm going to do the show and then take the rest of the day off to watch the eclipse. And that should line up just good. So, yes, we will do a show on Monday. So look out for that. Meanwhile, here on Giant Bomb, today we have UPF, where we're going to play Content Warning. Really looking forward to that. Then we have BCR, where we're going to discuss something. Honestly, I still, I'm still not sure. We're going to talk about some of the games we've been playing, and then we'll, we'll come up with some topic. Uh, look out for that. That'll be at 3 p.m. Eastern. Uh, uh, the UPF is at 1 p.m. Eastern. Look out for that. It'll be a good time. Uh, and in the meantime, all throughout this weekend... Jan and Dan are going to be uploading various things from WrestleMania. They already did a uh, power bomb cast with their predictions for the show. It looks very like a very good time. Uh, Jan described it as wrestling E3, and it really does look like that's what it was like for them out there. So, uh, well, plenty of stuff on Giant Bomb and GiantBomb.com for the next few days. Look out for that. In the meantime, Jesse, thank you so much for spending today talking with me about, about video games. I really appreciate it, man. I appreciate you. Thanks for having me. This was a blast. Anytime. We'll get you back on the show frequently. Uh, thank you all for watching. You're the best audience of gaming. Until next time, have a good one. Take care of yourself. And goodbye.